Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Blevins with the worship team. Welcome to Brushy Creek, where everything we do is based upon rescuing the lost, growing as believers, and serving others. Before we start worship today, there are several things I wanted to share. Do you have some extra time on your hands this week? Please consider joining Rescue Pastor Jim Russell at Redeemer Church in West Greenville. Each day, we're going to do some landscaping and other projects as they prepare for a neighborhood festival. Even if you can only work an hour here or there, it would be very helpful. One of Creekside Kids' favorite activities returns to campus next Saturday, Nerf Wars. It's only $5 and the kids have a ball running off energy while learning about meeting objectives and working together as a team. You can register your child and their friends at brushycreek.org. Easter is just two weeks away, and we have a new event this season. We'll be holding a Good Friday service on April 15th at 7 p.m. And then on Easter Sunday, Creekside Kids will host Resurrection Celebration, while Pastor Corey presents the Easter message at 9 and 1030 services. Our weekly newsletter, website, and bulletin have a lot more information on summer camps and the women's spring retreat. All you have to do is click on the QR code here on the screen or in the seat back in front of you to have the information at your fingertips. And now, let's turn to worship. Amen. You may be seated. Wow. Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, maybe you're using a, a, a book like mine or, or an electronic device. Either way, uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of John in the 18th chapter. The Gospel of John, uh, so that's one of the four Gospel accounts, the eyewitness accounts of Jesus found in the New Testament. We are, as we began last week, just working through the last couple of hours, really, of Jesus' life leading up to Easter. Uh, we are retracing the steps of Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. And as we do that, we are reminded that this is the only story that matters. That the story of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, everything hinges on it. If it is not true, then we have no hope. If there is no resurrection, we have no answer for sin, no answer for death, no answer for eternal life. Everything in all of human history and all of the future, everything in your life and in my life and in the life of everyone who's ever been created hinges on this story, the Easter story. And I reminded you last week, as we study the Easter story, we should be aware that we know this story. I'm not going to read a text today that, that's going to surprise many of you. You're going to read and hear the story of Jesus and how the Jews treated him, and how Peter denied him, how he was arrested, how he was carried off. We're going to look at how he died on the cross, how he rose from the grave. We're going to read the story. And much of that story you've heard year after year after year after year. You've seen children retell it in pageants. You've heard poems and songs. We know the Easter story. So my challenge is, and my heart is, is that as we study this story, as you hear the facts again, as you hear the intellectual knowledge of what Jesus went through for you and me, that your heart will grow in affection towards him. Ultimately, brothers and sisters, here's what my desire is for us as we study the last hours of Jesus. That you will just love him more. That you'll just be overwhelmed with who he is and what he has done. And your heart will, as we say in the story of the Grinch, grow three times larger. You'll just love him. You'll just see how, how special and wonderful and amazing Jesus is. That it is good that he is our Savior and our Lord, we are tracing the story of Easter through the Gospel of John, the retelling of John, a, an eyewitness to the story. In fact, we'll see today that he's actually in the story. And we are tracing these last hours. And what we're about to read is what happens after Jesus is arrested in the garden. Now, just by way of catching you up or reminding you, last week we began in chapter 18 of John in the first 11 verses, and that's where Jesus leaves the upper room with his disciples. So it's Thursday. He goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and while he's praying, Judas, the betrayer, brings the Roman soldiers and the Jewish leaders into the garden. He kisses Jesus, as the Gospels will tell us. They arrest Jesus, and now we pick up the story in verse 12, where they are carrying Jesus off, to be tried, to go to trial. 
And so if you will, join me in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. You'll recall just quickly that that Peter pulled out his sword there. He cut off the ear of Malachus. He thinks that he's going to stop them from getting Jesus. Jesus says, put your sword away. This has to happen. And now he is being bound and carried off. And, And I want you to see as we read this, uh, the, the theme or the thought is, is, as last week we saw Jesus was arrested, this week we'll see that Jesus, on his way to the cross, becomes more and more and more alone. That he's totally by himself. That he alone will walk the path of death for sin. That he alone is the Savior. That he alone will face what's coming. Join me in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. I'm going to read through verse 27. So the band of soldiers and their captain and their officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Ananias, for for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that he would uh, be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door, so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temples where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Verse 22, when he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about it. The wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Ananias then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it. And at once, a rooster crowed. Would you pray with me, Father? This morning as we retell this story, as we look at this again, uh, Lord, help us to see it fresh and new. Help us to see Jesus and how beautiful he is, how wonderful he is. How he is mistreated, he is abused, he is made a mockery of, but yet he quietly, silently marched to the cross for us. Lord, I pray this morning that, that all of us, everyone under the sound of my voice, will just We'll just stare at what Jesus did and love him. Father, for the one that's here that may not know Jesus as Savior, they may not be a Christ follower, a Christian, they're not sure of their sins, forgiveness, or their eternal hope, then I pray this morning they will see a Jesus who went to a place they could not go so that they may be saved. Father, bless us now as we see this story again, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We have to understand what's happening in the life of Jesus. In the course of Jesus' arrest, he will actually be put before two different courts. He will go before the Jewish court, and he will go before the Roman court. The Jewish court, under the Roman guise, was allowed to manage itself and deal with most of its issues. The difference was is the Jewish court was not allowed to carry out the death penalty. The Old Testament law gave the Jews reasons for death penalty, but Romans would not let them have the power of execution. So if they wanted to execute someone according to their law, they still had to bring it to Rome and get a verdict. So Jesus will literally go between two courts over the next few hours. He will go from the Jewish court to the Roman court. Not only will he go from two different courts, he will go in front of four different judges. In this text alone, he will be examined by two different people, Ananias and Caiaphas. Now, Ananias is the former high priest and Caiaphas is the current high priest. We read this up in verse 14. Now what we learn about, if you study Jewish history, you'll understand that Ananias was the high priest, and the high priest was a lifetime position. High priest meant that they were over the council of the Jewish priests, that when they held court, he got to sit in the judgment seat, and he was kind of the Supreme Court judge, the head chief judge, if you will, of the Jewish court. 
But the Romans decided that it was not good for one high priest to have that much power, so they required the Jews to remove and sort out and have a rotating system. So Caiaphas is his son-in-law, and he's put in as high priest. But if you read Jewish history even further, you'll come to understand that Ananias was high priest, four of his sons would serve as high priest, and his son-in-law Caiaphas would serve as high priest. So Ananias is like the Don Corleone of high priests. I told that in the first service. They did not laugh. <laughs> I think they were judging my movie taste. He's the godfather. For those of you that don't know, watch the TV version. He's the godfather of high priest. He's over it. So in this first trial, they literally grab Jesus and they take him to this former high priest who's still the one that they look to, who's still in authority. Now they'll eventually send him to Caiaphas for the official trial, but this is a preliminary inquisition, if you will. Now what John does for us in this story is, is really striking. He will tell the narrative in two scenes. You know how when you watch a movie the movie will cut to one action over here, and then it will cut away to a different story on another side, and eventually the stories intersect. They, they come together. You will see this in some famous movies, like maybe you're, you're watching like the, the Lord of the Rings, and, and you have the, the hobbits are over here, and you got the, the elves over there, and, the, and the, those really bad things over there, and, and they finally all collide together. Well, John will record the story where we get flashes from what Peter's doing and what Jesus is doing. And he doesn't do this on accident. He does this on purpose so that we will understand that in the midst of this moment, Jesus is standing and saying, I am. And Peter is wilting and saying, I am not. And we have these two pictures that show us strikingly that as Jesus moves closer and closer and closer to the cross, he will be utterly alone. Not only will his enemies be against him, but his friends will turn against him. Jesus goes to a place where you and I could not go, and he goes alone. Let me show you what I mean. I want you to see three ways in which Jesus is alone in this text. Number one, Jesus simply stands alone. He stands in the court, the prosecution alone. No one will stand with him. No one will go for him. Let's begin with the story of Peter there in verse 15. It says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. The Gospel of Matthew will tell us that Peter followed from a distance. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, they come to arrest Jesus. They bind Jesus up. Jesus sends his disciples. They go scattering in fear. And at some point, Matthew, excuse me, at some point, Peter begins to catch back up to the soldiers marching with the torches, and he follows from a distance where they're taking Jesus. And the Bible says here in verse 12 that another disciple went with him. Now, we believe this is John. John has this way that when he's writing the gospel, he doesn't insert his own name. He will call himself the one in which Jesus loved. He will call him the beloved disciple. He never puts the attention on himself, but we believe this to be John. So John and Peter, among all the disciples that scattered, follow the crowd marching to the temple court at a distance. They're lurking. They're in the shadows. It's dark. It's early in the morning. The sun is not out. It's a cool spring Passover weekend in Jerusalem. And they begin to follow from a distance. Now notice with me what happens. Look there in verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. And since that disciple was known by the high priest, that means John knew the people working the gate, he entered in with Jesus into the courtyard. John was allowed to go in. We don't know why, but somehow or another, he knows these people. He has connections. Maybe he grew up going to temple there. Maybe his father was the fish supplier to the priest, and so he had a, a deal with his father's fishing business. We, we don't know. But the Bible says he was allowed access. But Peter, look there in verse 16. Peter stood outside the door. They don't know Peter. Now notice what it says. So the other disciple, John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Verse 17. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. And now the servants and the officers made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing there warming themselves. And so Peter also was standing with them warming themselves. Now think about what's happened. Peter is in the garden with Jesus. The soldiers come down the lane. Judas is walking with the enemy. 
Jesus is standing up saying, I'm the one you want. Leave my disciples alone. Peter, with all of his courage, pulls out a sword. You can find this in the first 11 verses of this chapter. He starts to swing the sword at Malachus, one of the servants of the high priest. He literally cuts his ear off. The Gospels tell us Jesus healed the man's ear. Peter runs and scared in fear, scatters into the night. And then he catches back up. He lurks with the crowd. He makes his way in, and he's stopped at the door by the servant girl. Now, the servant girl's job is to maintain the palace. She is the one who gives the soldiers water when they enter back in. She takes their cloaks. She runs the house. She's the boss of the servant world. She knows everybody that comes in and out. She knows all of the business. I've seen enough episodes of Downton Abbey to know the maids know everything. They know. So she knows everybody and everyone that crosses over into that place. And so Peter walks up and she says... Hey, I think I recognize you. You don't come here before. You've never been in this place. But I, I'm certain I've seen you with Jesus, the one they've arrested. I know you. You were with him. In fact, I remember that day. I remember that day when Jesus was in the temple and he got mad just a few days ago of them exchanging money. And he starts flipping tables and he made a whip and he starts running people out. And man, my boss, the high priest, he was mad. He was fit to be tied. I remember that day. And he said, I'm going to get him and all of his disciples. I remember that. I remember that day on that Sabbath where Jesus healed that man's hand and my boss, the high priest, started taking names of who the disciples were. I'm sure I know you. Now notice what Peter says. Peter says in the text these famous first words of his three denials, I am not. Isn't it amazing that just a few hours, maybe even moments, Moments before, Peter is in a garden side by side with Jesus with his sword out ready to fight for Christ. And in a few moments as he gets scattered from Jesus, as he feels the pressure of the enemy coming around him, all of his courage meets with saving his own skin and he folds. He falls. All of his boasting and all of his strength and all of his pride when pressed, falls. He denies Jesus, can you think of a more painful thing than when a friend betrays you? I mean, it's one thing for the Jews to hate Jesus. It's one thing for the Romans to hate Jesus. It's one thing for the crowd to think he's causing trouble. It's another thing for Peter who walked on water with Jesus and fed the 5,000 with Jesus and communed at the table with Jesus and saw Jesus raise Peter's uh, uh, mother-in-law from the dead. Like he, he was there. He watched Jesus cast the demons into the swine. What a waste of barbecue. Some of you will get that on the way home. He was there. He was there for all of it. He was the one who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He's the one who just said in the upper room when Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. No, I won't, Jesus. I'll go with you to the death. And then when the going got tough and the chaos around abounded, Peter said, I am not. Think about how strikingly different this is. In just a moment, we'll read about Jesus and how they questioned him. And Jesus, instead of making up stories or lying, just continues to say, I am. And Peter says, I am not. There is a contrast here between God in the flesh, Christ, who is going where no one can go, and he begins to go by himself, and with every step he takes to the cross, he is getting more and more and more alone, because where he is going, no one else can go. And now even his friends are falling away. Now even those who are supposed to be standing beside him are falling. Now even those who claim to know him are falling away. And notice what it says in the text in verse 18. Now the servants and the officers, remember this is in the wee hours of the morning. It's cold, it's a spring morning. 
The house is waking up. The soldiers who marched to get Jesus are back in the courtyard. They're sending out the messengers to get the rest of the priests to gather for the Sanhedrin council so they can have the real trial. There is commotion. They're beginning probably to cook some breakfast. Like People are waking up, so they're building charcoal fires. I want you to mark that in your Bible, by the way. There in verse 18, it says, Peter went and stood with the soldiers, with the servants, by a charcoal fire. I don't want you to miss that detail. He went to sit by a charcoal fire... In uh, with the enemy. Now, now think about what's happening. Peter is now standing with the enemy. Just as Judas walked down the lane with the soldiers, now Peter is identifying with the enemy. He's standing with those who just bound Jesus and brought him in. Peter has switched teams. Peter has denied Christ and stands by the fire with the den of thieves. He's on the wrong side. Now, there are two lessons we must draw from this really, really, really clearly. The first one is, whenever we read the Easter story, we always like to categorize the characters. There are the bad guys. Pilate, Herod, Ananias, Caiaphas, the Jews, the crowd yelling, crucify him, the people spitting on him, the soldiers punching him. That's all the bad guys in the story. But then, then we like to categorize the good guys. There's Mary and Martha and Peter and James and Joseph of Arimathea who would give up his tomb. These are the good guys. They're on the right side. And what we find in the denial of Peter is the truth that we need to hear today. Brothers and sisters, in the crucifixion of Christ, there are no good guys. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. No, not one. Peter is just as sinful as the soldiers. Peter is just as broken as Judas. Mary needs a Savior just like Caiaphas needs a Savior. We are all fallen and separated from God. There is no one righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in the denials of Peter, we will find ourselves understanding that we too, if we were there, we would be the cowards in the ground screaming, we don't know him. Why? Because brothers and sisters, that's what sin is. Every sin you ever commit is a declaration that Jesus is not in charge, but you are. Every sin that you ever commit is a declaration that God doesn't know what's best. You know what's best. Every sin you ever perform, every thought you ever think, every heart that moves away from God is just a declaration that I am not with Him. That's what sin is. And so before we gather up all of our courage in this room and say, boy, Peter blew it, we wouldn't have done it. Brother and sister, we do it all day long, every day. And Jesus, Jesus is the only one who walks perfectly in this world to a cross where no one else can go. He is absolutely alone. There's a second lesson from Peter that I think we need to make sure we hear, and that's simply this. We have to be careful in boasting in our own strength. Think about what Peter does. Peter, in the garden grabs a sword and stands by Jesus. Now, if you remember, if you read the first 11 verses of of this chapter, you'll recall that when Jesus spoke, all the soldiers fell to the ground. So, So Jesus has displayed his power as the King of kings and Lord of lords. So Peter's pretty sure he's on the right team when he's standing shoulder to shoulder to Jesus. And so he pulls his sword out because, hey, I'm with the guy who can speak and you can all fall. So it's like, let's do this. I'm ready. It's like having MJ on your team. You're going to win in basketball, right? Like, it's good. You're ready. Uh, And so, you, by the way, LeBron is not MJ. So we're there. And so we, we pull, he pulls out his sword. That was totally free, by the way. He pulls out his sword and he's ready to fight for Jesus. And then, and then it gets hard. And then the enemy seems to surround him. And Jesus seems to be distant. Life's not going the way Peter thought it would go. And the same guy who was ready to fight for Jesus is now scared to die for Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, that is a hypocrisy of a fake walk with the Lord when you can stand on Sunday and say, I'm ready to fight for Jesus, but on Monday you wilt in your faith. We must learn from Peter that there is no confidence in our flesh, but only in Christ. We must not boast in who we are because we will fold and fall and fail because it's only Christ and Christ alone in us that can cause us to stand with strength and with faith in the days that are challenging.
Raymond Brown, in his commentary on Peter's denial, writes it this way. He says, Peter's multiple denials is a warning to all who would claim self-confidently that they would follow Jesus wherever he leads them. Boasting of our own abilities is an invitation to failure. That's what, exactly what Peter discovered. But I start to say, I wouldn't do that. I'll go there. I'll stand for Jesus. I'm strong. I'm bold. Look at me. I'm walking out on thin ice. Instead, I should say, I am broken and fallen and feeble in every direction. But Christ in me. Christ for me. Christ strengthening me. By God's grace, I will do it. Peter is a warning to us that all need to be saved and that all need to be mindful of the pride of trusting in our own flesh. And what do we find? Jesus is standing alone. Peter has now fallen back by the fire, scared for his life. Let me show you a second truth from the text. Now the scene will change. Not only do we see Jesus standing alone, but we see Jesus will suffer alone. Look with me at verse 19. John changes the scene. It flashes back now to Peter. It's going back and forth between uh, Peter's story and Jesus' story. While Peter is out by the fire being a coward, Jesus is in the courthouse of the high priest being uh, courageous, being honest. While, While Peter is saying, I am not, Jesus is saying, I am. We have this contrast between these two. And notice what happens in John chapter 18, verse 19. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to you, uh, openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said. They know what I have spoken. Now think about just the irony of this for a moment. Jesus is on trial. The sinless son of God being tried by sinful man. The perfect high priest being scrutinized by this broken, fallen, former godfather high priest. Just think about the irony. That these who will judge the creator will one day on their knee stand before Christ, the creator of all, and be judged for eternity. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but if Corey were Jesus, this wouldn't go the same way. I'm so thankful that Jesus held his tongue and his might and marched humbly alone to this place. That he allowed himself to suffer alone, to be mocked alone. He allowed himself to restrain the power of heaven and the angels and the legions in order to be judged for you and for me. And notice what the Bible says. They began to quiz him. They noticed with me in the text. What does it say? It says, tell us about your teaching and your disciples. What have you been saying Now, what Ananias is doing is he's trying to gather up incriminating messages or incriminating thoughts or have Jesus say something that he can now send to Caiaphas for the real trial and use it against Jesus. But you got to understand something, that this is an entire mockery of the Jewish system. The Jewish courts were not allowed to have court at dark. They were not supposed to be having a trial of Jesus when the sun was not up. They were also not to be having court without two witnesses. But there are no witnesses. No one is there speaking for or against Jesus. They were also not supposed to strike prisoners or treat them in this way. But we'll notice in a few verses that they actually punched Jesus in the face. And we know they sent money by Judas, blood money, in order to get Jesus there. So this is not a courtroom. This is not a trial. This is a kangaroo court. This is an inquisition. This is a bloodbath. They are working to kill Jesus. They are making up the rules as they go, breaking their own customs and their codes in order to get Jesus on the cross. And they have to work fast because the Romans' court will open at daylight and stop at lunch. And on the Sabbath, which would be Saturday, they're not allowed to kill anybody. So they got to get him to the Roman leaders by Friday morning for this to work. They are working fast. In fact, if you were to read verse 14, notice what it says. It says in, excuse me, verse 13. First they led him to Ananias for the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Back in John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And in John chapter 11, uh, verse 49, Caiaphas hears about the commotion of Lazarus being back from the dead. And now the Jews are starting to think Jesus is the real Messiah. And Rome is starting to pay attention. And so Caiaphas says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to kill this one Jew, Jesus, so that the whole nation will be saved from Rome coming in and marching. What Caiaphas didn't know is he's a prophet. 
Because the one man Jesus will die, but it's not to save them from Rome, it's to save people from their sins. But they've been plotting to kill Jesus since the 11th chapter of John. You might say to yourself, man, this is out of control. Well, let me show you the ninth chapter of Luke and remind you that long before they were plotting to kill Jesus, God had a plan. Jesus saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. It may look like this courtroom is out of control, but it's doing exactly what the sovereign God planned for it to do. Jesus will walk alone to his death, and he will walk alone to a death that is a plan of God before the creation of time. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, For I delivered unto you a first importance, that which I also received, that Christ came and died and was buried, and on the third day arose from the grave. According to the scriptures, it was God's plan that Jesus would die. They think they're in control. They are not. But I want you to notice something with me. Notice what Jesus suffers alone. Notice what it says. In verse 19 it says, Tell us about your disciples and your teaching. Now, they really don't care about Jesus' teaching. They really don't care what he has to say about doctrine, philosophy, or God, because when they take him to the Romans, they will say he's just a political person trying to start an insurrection. They won't care about his doctrine. They don't care about what he's teaching. They just want him to say something so the Jews will hate him and the Romans will kill him. But I want you to notice something else in this sentence. Look closely. Don't miss this. He says in verse 19, The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Verse 20, Jesus answered them saying, I have spoken openly to the world. Did you notice how many questions they asked Jesus? They asked him two. Tell us about your disciples. Tell us about your teaching. Jesus only answers one. He says, I've been teaching in the courtyards and the synagogues and the temples openly and publicly. I've done nothing in secret. Everything I've done has been in the open. You Jews may be plotting behind closed doors how to kill me, but I've never said anything that I wouldn't say in public that I haven't said in private and vice versa. I'm not a hypocrite of the truth and lies. I tell the truth everywhere I go. He pulls the attention to him. Why? Because notice what he does. They're asking about his disciples. Where is your followers? Let us get some names. We want to round them up. We want to squash this rebellion. And Jesus will not talk about his disciples. Why? Because the great shepherd is protecting his sheep. He is guarding them all the way to the death. He will go alone. Now, I don't know about you, but I had a sibling growing up. I had cousins growing up. We would oftentimes get into trouble. It would usually be their fault, but we would get into trouble. And as we got into trouble, when one of us got caught, everybody went down. We would rat and snitch in a heartbeat. If I got to take the whooping, you got to take the whooping. Not our Lord. Our Lord marches this path to the cross, and every step of the way, it gets lonely and lonely and lonely. And every step of the way, he is constantly looking back at his disciples and shielding them from what they cannot do. They cannot go to the cross. They cannot die as he's dying. They cannot take on sin as he's taking on sin. He is guarding his sheep all the way to his death. And he is alone. You know what's striking? There are no witnesses accusing Jesus. And there are no witnesses standing up for Jesus. How painful it must be for Christ to have all of his friends desert him. And yet, he walks alone to this grave. He walks alone to this cross. He walks alone to this way. Notice what happens in the text. Look there, verse 21. He says, why do you ask me? Ask those who've heard. They know what I've said. When he said these things, the officer standing by struck Jesus with his hand. Does that not strike you? Like, The Bible says in Psalm 139 that God created us and formed us in our mother's womb. It tells us in another part of Scripture that he numbers the hairs on our head. You know the joke, right? For some of you, that's harder than others. It's because you're bald. You get it? Never mind. Um, But the idea is that that Jesus knows everything. He's standing there letting them question him. And all he does is tell the truth. I've said the same thing everywhere I've gone. I've spoke, I've healed, I've preached. Go find all those masses that hurt. Where's the 5,000 I fed? Bring them in here. What do they do? A hand. A hand that he formed. 
A hand that he placed in a mother's womb. A hand that he numbered the days of their life. A hand, a hand that he knows backwards and forwards, curls up its fist and punches him in the face. The very hand that he made. The creation striking the creator. And Jesus takes it. He suffers. One of the things about the crucifixion story that always just kind of, kind of gnaws on me is not the death of Jesus, though it is amazing. But the Bible tells us in the Old Testament that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin and that the lamb must die and that Jesus is the perfect lamb of God. So I understand that Jesus went to the cross and died. What I always wrestle with is why did he have to go in such a humiliating, suffering way? Why did they spit on him? Why did they cast lots for his clothes? Why did they shove thorns on his head? Why did they punch him in the face? Why did they mock him? All he ever did was heal and teach and preach and care for people. Why would they treat him this way? Why would he suffer all the way up until death? I'm not sure I can answer all of those theological questions, but here's the one application I know for sure. That when we see the suffering of Jesus all the way up until his death, all by himself, there is one overarching thought we should have. Man, he loves us. He loves you. Because Corey, at the first punch in his mouth, is out. I'm done. The first scourging of the whip, I'm collapsing. When they lay a cross on my shoulders, I'm confessing sins I've never done and ratting out anybody else I can find. And Jesus takes the suffering. He takes the curse. He takes the beating. He takes the humiliation. He's treated like the worst among us. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, the simple application is this. He loves you. He absolutely loves you. And Whenever you find yourself overwhelmed and you think, man, I can't figure it out. I don't know what's going to happen. Life seems hard. This doesn't seem fair. Just stare back at the lonely walk of Jesus to the cross and be reminded whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, Jesus knows, he understands, and he loves you. He loves you. We sing often the the old song, Oh, how he loves you and me. The suffering of Jesus reminds me that he loves me, but he will suffer alone. He will suffer by himself. He will suffer alone. Look with me at the last part, and we'll close here. Verse 25, I want you to see finally that Jesus saves alone. That he alone can be our Savior. Look at verse 25. We flash back to Peter. What's been going on with Peter? We've seen Jesus. We've watched him now be courageous. We've seen Peter wilt. So what's going on with Peter? Let's go back to the story of Peter. John cuts back to the scene. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. Now you've got to understand that John can see Jesus because he's an eyewitness and he can see Peter. He's somewhere in the middle. But all four Gospels record the denial of Peter. Mark's Gospel is written because Peter told him what to write as an eyewitness account. So you've got to understand that Peter let all four of the Gospels record his denial. He did not edit it out. He wanted it in there. Make sure you tell them about how I failed miserably. Now notice with me what happens. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. Now the first time, maybe he denies it because he just wants to get past the girl and get in. He doesn't want to be hassled. The second time, it might be just because of the chaos and the moment and they've seen Jesus get hit in the mouth and he just doesn't know what's going on. So we'll give him a pass for one, and we'll give him a pass for two. But notice what happens now. There's an eyewitness. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off. Oh, yeah, you remember that sword you were wielding earlier? We saw you. We know it was you. Did I not see you in the garden with him? Now look at verse 27. Peter again denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. I want you to see how Luke records this. In um, Luke's gospel, it's recorded with a little more detail. It says, but Peter said, man, I do not know you. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. In fact, Mark says he swears. I swear I don't know Jesus. I pinky promise I've never seen him before. I don't know who this man is. Notice what it says. 
And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Luke tells us that there was a line of sight between where Jesus was and Peter was. Maybe Jesus is up on the terrace. Maybe they're bringing him now through the courtyard to get to Caiaphas for the official trial. Whatever the case may be, Peter and Jesus are able to lock eyes across the room, across the courtyard. And Peter's just said for the third time, which Jesus predicted, and Peter denied, he just said for the third time, I don't know this man. And Peter remembered what the Lord said. And before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Now notice this last sentence. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Paul writes in the book of 2 Corinthians that there are two types of repentance. There is repentance that is worldly that leads to death. And there is repentance of righteousness which leads to life. Repentance of worldly things is when you get caught and you say, Oh man, I'm going to lose my, my family, my house. I feel bad. I'm going you know, to be shamed in the neighborhood. Righteous repentance says, oh man, I've sinned against God, and I need to make it right with God. Peter left and wept, and we know later in the story, we'll get to it in just a moment, that Peter wept differently than Judas wept because he was broken over his sin. But, but I want you to see something in the story. Look with me at verse 27. Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Now, when we read this story, the rooster is always linked to Peter. By the way, Bible scholars will tell us that this could be an actual rooster, that it could be that God predicted that a rooster would crow three times, or the changing of the guard of the Roman soldiers was done all through the night, and the morning hour, the 6 a.m. hour, there would be a sound that would ring out three times that was often referred to as the rooster's call. And so it could be just the banging of this trumpet or gong. But either way, that's not important to the story. There is some identifiable noise, and that Peter will deny Jesus three times while that noise, before that last noise, that last bong, that last rooster crow. Now, now I want you to notice something with me. The rooster crowing is always tied to Peter's denial. It's always tied to Peter saying, I don't know him, I've never heard of him. Man, I swear I'm not with Jesus. But the rooster crowing marks something way better than Peter's denial. The rooster crowing marks the dawn of a new day. The rooster crowing dawn is Friday. The rooster crowing declares this is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ will go to the cross and bleed and die for sinners. Listen to me now. Don't miss this. While Peter is denying Jesus and hears the rooster and runs away and weeps bitter tears, his tears will not fix his sin, but the blood of Christ will. So we hear this rooster declaring, we are sinners, we are fallen, we are broken, we are separated from God. We weep bitterly and have no hope. But we should remember when we hear that rooster crow that that's the dawning of the day that our Lord Jesus Christ marched to Calvary and died for you and for me. I'm sure Peter never forgot the sound of a rooster. But I'm certain he never forgot that that started Friday the greatest day for his forgiveness when Christ began to die. He went to the cross and he died for Peter. Psalms 35 says, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Peter heard the rooster, ran and cried, and Jesus went and died. He saved him. He redeemed him. And you know what this tells me? It tells me that nobody's too far. Can you think of a more worse scoundrel in the entire Easter story than Peter? Yeah, you might say Judas or the Roman soldiers. You might say Caiaphas or Ananias or the Jews because they're just mean and evil. But I'll tell you, we already knew they were mean and evil. But to have your closest companion, your best friend on earth, the one you've walked on water with and broke bread with, the one you've taught, the one you've poured your life into, the one that you've slept day and night traveling the country for three years, to have your best friend stab you in the back and say, I don't know him, and run away, I don't think it gets much worse than that. And yet Peter is the one in which Jesus builds the church on. Why? Because you're never too far, brothers and sisters. If you weep tears of bitter contrition and repentance, God will save you. In fact, I want to close with this. Look back with me real quickly at one verse. It says in verse 18, 
Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them. Now, a charcoal fire is lit, and it's smoking and filling up the courtyard. And Peter is there warming himself by this fire because it's still night at this point, and, and he's trying to find out what's happening to Jesus. And while this courtyard is feeling with charcoal smoke, Peter is denying Jesus over and over and over. And then he runs away and weeps bitterly. But I want to recall your attention to a different part of John. If you were to flip just a few pages over to John chapter 21, you'll read a story after Jesus' resurrection. The story goes like this. It's the true redemption of Jesus. The story goes this way. Peter is now out in a boat on the Sea of Galilee fishing. Jesus has been resurrected. He's appeared to them in the upper room in Jerusalem. He tells them to go to Galilee and wait for him. And so Peter is fishing on the sea, on the shore. Now, we don't know why Peter's fishing. Maybe it's because it's comfortable to him. Maybe it's because he's hungry. Maybe he's gone back to that business because he thinks Jesus will never take him back. And so he's got to make a, a name for himself in the fishing market again. But the Bible says in John chapter 21, they've been fishing all night and they've had no luck. Then Jesus walks up on the shore, but they don't realize who he is. And he yells out to them, how's the fishing? We all do this, right? Getting any bites? What jig you using? And they say, we haven't had any luck. And Jesus says, throw your net to the other side. Isn't it always good when somebody walks up and gives you an opinion about fishing? <laughs> throw your nets to the other side. The Bible records in John chapter 21, they caught so many fish, their nets began to rip. The boats, they needed help. And Peter immediately realizes this is a miracle, and that is Jesus. And he grabs his coat, he puts it on. He doesn't even wait for the boat to be parked in the slip. He jumps into the water. He runs up on the shore. And John chapter 21 finds Jesus over a charcoal fire. Now we're people of smell. I bet you money you can remember the smell of your grandmother's house. I bet you can remember the smell of your mama's apple pie. You can remember the smell of your wife's perfume, your husband's cologne. You can remember the smell of your seventh grade son coming home from baseball or football practice. <laughs> you know that smell. It's a mix of sweat and Axe body spray and it is disgusting. Smells bring back memories. We remember things. Oh, that reminded me of my grandmother. That reminded me of, of my friend. Oh, that reminded me of that, that fresh-cut field of grass we used to play on as a kid. We, we remember things through smells. Can you just imagine for a moment? Peter, who always is impulsive, throws on his coat. He runs up on the shore. He's getting close to Jesus, and the smoke of the charcoal hits his nostrils. And he remembers. The last time he was next to a charcoal fire, he said, I do not know you. He remembers that he had three opportunities to declare his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of suffering. And he says, I don't know who you are. I wonder, and I don't know, this is speculation, but I wonder if he backs away. I wonder what he thinks to say. I, I wonder what he does. But if you go on to read the story, Jesus says, bring some fish. Let's have some bread. Now, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but my Lord's kind of a redneck. He can cook fish right on the shore. And they sit down together. And in John chapter 21, we have this famous exchange between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus says to Peter, not one time, not two times, but three times. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And in that moment, over a charcoal fire, all of Peter's sins are washed away. Because the rooster crowing may have meant something to Peter, but it meant a lot more to the eternal plan of God because Jesus went to the cross for him. And he saved his soul. And here's the glorious truth of the story, and this is where I'll close. Jesus went alone to his death. But after his resurrection, he has promised us we never have to be alone. He was divided from all of his disciples, and he went by himself up the hill of Calvary. But yet after his resurrection, 
He gathers all of his sheep up and he says to us, come to me who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He went alone, so we never have to. Oh, what Jesus is this. Would you pray with me, Father? My heart is... Well, I certainly hope you've enjoyed worshiping with us online. What a blessing technology can be. Today, as you heard God's word preached and as you sang with God's believers, I, I pray that the Lord spoke to you in a special way. In fact, I want to invite you to connect with us even more. Maybe today the Lord is pressing upon your heart a need for prayer. Maybe the Lord is pressing on you that you need to follow him in a more tangible way. Whatever the case may be, whatever the Lord may be saying to you, I, I want you to know that Brushy Creek is here for you, that we want to help you in your walk with Christ. In fact, I want to invite you to contact our church office anytime, Monday through Thursday, 830 to 430. Or you can email the the address you see at the bottom of the screen, and let us know that you worship with us. We'd love to know about you. We'd love to join you in praying for the things that are going on in your life and strengthen your walk. And as always, I want to invite you to come join us in person. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe you haven't been able to get out, but now you're ready. We would love to have you as a guest at our church service. Thank you again for worshiping with us. May God bless you.